Welcome everyone to Monday Match Analysis. I'm Gil Gross. Today's episode is a conversation with Mark Petchy, where, as we always do, on the second Monday of a major, we'll preview every single men's quarterfinal match. All four of them. I will start with uh, some quick notes on some of the action that we saw today. I will, uh, I'll skip Medvedev Lahechka. Unfortunate to see the injury in that one. Uh, but I do want to start with Chris Eubanks defeating and upsetting Stefanos Tsitsipas. A couple of takeaways here. First of all, it was highly dramatic, highly entertaining. Came down to the wire at the end of the fifth set. Eubanks saved a break point that would have made it 5-all. And I noticed after he'd saved the break point, and literally a major quarterfinal is on the line. And here's a guy who was not in the top 100 before three months ago. It's, it's the biggest match of his life, although he's had a bunch of big ones over the course of this run at Wimbledon. And it's this really tense, high-pressure moment. He saves a break point, and he's pumping up the crowd, looking like he's having a blast. Like, he's genuinely looking like he's having fun, which blew me away. I think most guys there, they kind of shell up. They freeze emotionally. They're stilted. And Eubanks looked loose. And he looked like he was having fun. That was insane to me. And he also played the next two points really, really well. And I don't think those two things are unrelated. The forehand was amazing down the stretch for Chris. That was really important. He needed it to attack those floating backhand returns. You can't say that that Tsitsipas was was missing all his backhand returns as the match progressed, you know, throughout Eubanks's last couple service games. He did put some in the court, and Chris's forehand needed to be there to take those opportunities because they were attackable, and Eubanks did a really good job of attacking them. I really love Chris's ability to get to net on return games. I've been thinking a lot about that when it comes to certain players in general, like a Maxime Cressy and his ability to break serve. We've seen it with a couple of Djokovic's opponents at this tournament, whether it be a Jordan Thompson who is serving volleying very effectively or a Hubert Hurkacz who's got great volleys and was serving great. When you, when you have a player who volleys really well and that's a big part of their game, one of the things I've noticed in the modern game is, you know, it's just tough to use that as an asset on return games. You have to really train yourself to be able to actually find patterns that enable you to get to net on return points. Eubanks covers the net great, huge wingspan, excellent volleys, and he's a guy who actually gets to net on return points. He did it twice in the three-all game, which is the game he ended up breaking Titi Pass in the fifth set. They were actually exchanging breaks over the, the last, I think, four games at that point. But that was the break that ultimately did it. Eubanks held the rest of the way. I'll also say about that three-all game, the break point was really impressive by Eubanks. Titi Pass hit this really good inside-out forehand. And he camped. You know, he didn't recover to the middle because he hit a strong inside-out forehand. And at that point, Tsitsipas wants to hit another forehand. And because he hit the ball well inside-out, good depth, good pace, good width, he anticipated that Eubanks was going to come back cross-court because it was going to be a difficult change of direction. And kudos to Chris Eubanks, who recognizes the court position in that particular moment recognizes that with my defensive skills and my movement and the way I want to play tennis, if I go cross court, I'm about to get attacked with Tsitsipas's best weapon, which is his forehand. This is the moment, even though it's a difficult change of direction on my one-handed backhand, this is my opportunity to take matters into my own hand and hit the drive down the line. It was risky. I don't know that he would have made it 10 out of 10 times in terms of how high percentage the shot was. But he absolutely nailed it. He struck it so clean. He timed it perfectly. It was a winner down the line. And that was how he uh, converted the break point. But another key to Eubanks ultimately winning the match was not just how he played down the stretch of the fifth. He had to figure out a way to steal one of the first three sets, 
where I, I think in most aspects of the game, he was second best. Obviously, he loses the first set. He loses the third set. But he steals the second set, which, of course, would end up being crucial. This was a point in the match where he was struggling with the wind. He was getting completely outmatched for consistency and execution off the ground. He was not putting, he was not applying any, any pressure on return. In the second set, it was Titi Pass who got the three break chances in two separate games. Chris saved all three of them because he found first serves to the backhand, and Titi Pass could not make a good return. In the tie break, Steph double faulted for the mini break, and I felt he had an opportunity at 6 4 in the tie break to, to maybe get it back on serve because he got a look at a second serve and he mishit the backhand return, which went out. So Eubanks ends up stealing a set where he won far fewer return points than his opponent, but sometimes big servers, and look, he said after the match, you don't have to play well the whole match. You just have to play really well at certain moments in the match. And this tie break was really well played by Eubanks. And it was an example of, you know, grabbing a set where you were probably second best for a lot of it. And he was probably second best for most of the first few hours of the day. But he comes out of it two sets to one and writes the ship in the fourth and the fifth. And to me, that's how he won the match. I got to bring this up. I have to. It is something that Tsitsipas Pass did that had he won the match, and it was close. He, he almost won the fifth. He was right there. Although he was, you know, fighting from behind after going down the break at 3-0. Uh, had he won the match, though, hypothetically, I would have been talking about this. It was so smart what he did. Tsitsipas Pass completely baited Eubanks into serving it into his forehand, particularly in the 2-3 game in the fifth set. He was on the deuce side, taking away the, the, the tee, and visually just making Eubanks look at all of this open space on, on the deuce side out wide and on the ad side up the tee. It was just about where Titi Pass was standing. He moved way over to his left, and I, I do wish as I was watching it, I was like, come on, Chris, don't fall for it. He fell for it, though. And by by the ner the nature of Titi Pass's return position, he got Eubanks to serve for the forehand that entire game at 2-3. And he got that break to 3-all using that tactic, which I just thought was was such a, a great example of Titi Pass thinking and playing a little bit of chess on the court. And ultimately, he just couldn't hang on to his serve in the very next game. Great job by Eubanks kind of moving on from that. I do think that Chris, for my liking, was serving into the forehand too much in the fifth set. Let's move on. Uh, how did Djokovic finally break Hercotch? Hubie's serving finally, it finally dipped in the fourth set. Finally. I, I mean, it was just so good for the first three sets. He was at 78% first serves in, heading into the fourth. He ended up down at 58%. In the in the fourth set, so significant dip in first serves. In aces were down as a whole on Monday. You know he hit 23 aces in two sets on Sunday. He hit 10 aces in two sets on Monday. It looked like Novak was reading a little bit better, reading it a little bit better. Maybe it's the conditions changing with the roof opening. I don't know. Three all. Novak finally gets the break. First time Hercotch was broken all tournament long. First time Novak was able to break him. It took a while. And Djokovic just, he showed his class in this three-all game. That's all I'll say. Because Hubie made plenty of first serves. He lost four points in this game where he made the first serve. Love all, 15 all, deuce, add out. And look, it's one thing if Novak kind of, I don't know, makes a stab return and puts the ball weakly into the service box and Hercotch misses a plus one forehand. That's one thing. And then I would say, like, all right, you know, it's kind of bad by Hercotch. Good job by Djokovic by, for making the return, but you can't give him much more credit than that. These returns were even more than that. These were genuinely neutralizing returns by Djokovic, four of them in this game, which is unbelievable against this serve. The 15-all return especially was uh, really as good as you'll ever see. And... uh 
On the break point, not only did Novak make a neutralizing return, he made Hercotch hit six forehands. So that's what you got to do. Great game by Novak at 3 all, and he served immaculately well in the fourth set. Hercotch didn't even get a sliver of opportunity throughout the entirety of the fourth set uh, with Novak on serve. Alcaraz Berrettini, I think I mentioned it the other day, but second serve points won were going to be the key, and that's where I just I couldn't see Berrettini really hanging, and he didn't. 59% second serves won for Alcaraz, 49% for Berrettini, so a 10% gap there. And the reason why I think it was easier for Alcaraz to win that stat category compared to Nicholas Jari is because Mateo can't attack off of his backhand return. So Alcaraz can kick it to the Berrettini backhand, and he has a neutral point. And more often than not, he has a forehand uh, to attack off the plus one even behind his second serve. And if he doesn't have a forehand, that's also okay because he's going to win more of the neutral rallies against Berrettini. What Jari was doing was really trying to be deadly off the forehand and the backhand return off of Alcaraz's second serve, and it was simply posing more of a threat. So that's the second serve points one. Can, can Berrettini make up for it with a first serve discrepancy? That's hard to do when you're Berrettini, you don't return all that well. You don't move at an elite level. You do not defend at an elite level. And when it comes to winning first serve return points, that's what it comes down to. You're, you're going to have to be usually playing some great defense and moving into the corners in order to win first serve return points. So that's why it's hard for Berrettini to make up for that second serve discrepancy on the first serve. I thought it was a, a great match by Alcaraz. 3-3-3 three, three, and three after dropping the first set. Dimitrov Runa. There's obviously more to it than what I'm about to say, but if I were to highlight one tactical key, Runa wore Dimitrov down on the backhand side. He was able to kind of work the points, extend the points, more, you know, not only was he probably more consistent going into Dimitrov's backhand corner and, and getting some errors there, but also he just felt so unthreatened that he could wait for the opening on Dimitrov's forehand side, backhand down the line, forehand inside in. And ultimately, it just felt like Dimitrov couldn't get out of jail because he couldn't take his backhand down the line. There was too much intensity with Runa's inside-out forehands, which he hits heavy, he hits deep, he hits hard. Dimitrov just can't really time that drive back end down the line in order to make Runa pay for camping on the ad side. And I think that was the main pattern that I saw in the match that was essential for Runa. Uh, but that said, it was just a really high-quality, entertaining battle between Dimitrov and Runa. I would give it uh, a 10 out of 10, if I'm being honest. Uh, but I do want to leave it at that. I want to get to Mark Petchy. We talk about the Wimbledon scheduling, and then we break down the four men's quarterfinals to come at Wimbledon 2023. We're joined once again by the great Mark Petchy, a very familiar voice to tennis fans for his commentary uh, heard on, on multiple outlets, including Tennis Channel in the United States. Uh, Petch, thank you so much for coming back on Monday Match Analysis. I can't wait to come back on Monday Match Analysis. Thanks for having me back on, Gil. Let's start with uh, your best take of the fortnight on Twitter, all right? The curfew. We've yeah. run into it twice here. There's a roof on center court. The, the matches, th there just hasn't been a great reason why this has happened twice with the discontinued matches. I guess let's start here because I think you have a, a maybe a better understanding of this than than others. Why does the All England Club uh, start at 1.30 p.m. local? And then then we can get to maybe what the solution could be. Listen, there's yeah, there's a there's a few things here. Obviously, the outside court starts at 11 o'clock, so that's obviously for people that come in on the grounds tickets. If you have a, a center or one, you can walk around and obviously pick up your favorite matches on the outside courts. Um, 
the the bottom line is that the play on number one starts at 1 p.m. Because, and then centre starts at 1.30 p.m. because obviously from a health and safety point of view, if you have that many tens of thousands of people walking around at the same time, it presents a pretty big risk in terms of spectators and the crushes and everything else. So there's a very good logical reason why the half an hour spacing between uh, centre and one is in place. And I don't think that there's anyone here that feels as though that necessarily should change. It wasn't always like that in the past, but be, but we shouldn't always live in the past. And if there's a better way and a safer way of doing things, then we should very much embrace that. So from that point of view, I have uh, I don't think any of us are sitting here, but Gil, you've watched as much tennis as I have watched in the last decade. And the narrative around tennis has always been, let's, it needs to speed up. Um, I think it's the wrong narrative in terms of the fact that our kids um, have shorter expense, uh, uh, um, attention spans. But the reality of it is that's not what I see. I see my kids with very long uh, attention spans. They can binge as long as the thing in front of them is keeping them occupied. What they have is great choice. Um, so, you know, so, so there's, there's many things out there that in tennis we talk about, but we don't really change. I don't think that from my perspective, that the game is sort of speeded up. In fact, it's got longer, which is why we find ourselves, um, at this curfew issue where matches starting at one thirty on center and now running, even if, you know, you look at it, there's one set too long. Last night was a classic example where, Basically, the match before the Schwantek Bencic match was three sets, which is a normal three set match and a best of five for the men. Novak only played two sets, which is obviously just a normal straight set win in a women's match. And then we had the five setter with um, obviously Rublev and Bublik. So, from that point of view, you don't have a lot of wriggle room if you can't finish all three matches. If you bought a ticket for Hamilton the musical and you don't go there to see Hamilton the musical and finish the musical, you're going to be seriously disappointed. And there were obviously a lot of Novak fans seriously disappointed about the outcome that they couldn't see their man finish last night. The reason that obviously these centre court matches start later, we have a lot of dementia holders, we have a lot of stakeholders that are invested, sponsors uh, that obviously want to come and enjoy the day. And we all understand that. Um, but I think it's got to the stage that from a point of view of it being an outdoor tournament we need to accept that these matches are going on as long as they are and make some adjustments and those adjustments would seem to be to move court number one to 12 o'clock and and center to 12 30 and and my suggestion was champagne brunch yes that would be the solution uh i love brunch i i don't know what's a quintessential What's a quintessential brunch in, in London? What's like the signature brunch food? I, 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 I'd go with a little Eggs Benedict. I think Eggs Benedict yeah. with, a, with a nice little sort of, uh, with a nice little glass of champagne. I, th I think we could sell that to, uh, to the people that are walking through the gates. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. So I, th I thought that was brilliant. And uh, I, I do want to wanna give you some, some numbers because I, I read it in The Athletic yeah. before the tournament. The average length of a men's Grand Slam match has increased from two hours, 21 minutes on average in 1999 to two hours, 54 minutes this year. Uh, so, I mean, we've seen that statistically, the, the lengthening of, of matches is, it's real. And it's for a lot of reasons, yeah. but I, I, love your, I love your take, by the way, on attention spans, that it's not the duration, it's the quality of the product. I think that's, uh, I think that's spot on. Yeah, I think. I, go ahead. Yeah, I just, I, I just said, I think that you know the powers that be that actually do have pull, not people like me uh, sitting at the sidelines, um, obviously talking about it. But I think they need to realize the numbers that you've just talked about, and not just put them to one side and accept that as the norm. It's baseball did a great job, obviously, this year of bringing in a shot clock, which has taken almost an hour out of baseball games, but they did it in a way that they knew it was going to work because they ran it in the minor leagues. Um, tennis brought in the shot clock without really running it at any kind of test. And it's actually produced longer tennis matches. And, and we shouldn't just accept that. We should try and figure out a way in this sport to take some of the dead air out of it. Yeah. And I would also add, not only is it bad for Novak fans, the, the, the people who bought tickets to watch the conclusion of all three matches, also there's a competitive imbalance 
you're Correct. changing you're changing outcomes potentially when you have players going back to the hotel and coming back the next day and you're compromising their rest potentially where their opponents have an off day with that said let's get into uh this quarterfinal lineup on the men's side which uh we now have in full uh we'll start on the bottom which will also be in order well not uh, roughly in order of uh the matches in terms of how they'll be played of course the top half or sorry the bottom half goes tomorrow uh the yeah. the other half goes the next day and let's start with Djokovic Rublev it is a three to one head-to-head for Novak the last two meetings have been fairly lopsided straightforward the Rublev one win was uh in Belgrade on clay when Djokovic kind of gassed out in the final uh and the third set I guess you know with Novak being of course the big favorite in this position and being so on top of this matchup I guess the question centered around Andre is what would be the arguments if you had to lawyer up for him that it's going to be different this time am I putting you in a tough position Uh, Petch (laughs) no I think it's a question you should ask I think everyone should ask it it's you know it's 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 what this sport is about this is why we love the sport is how does how does Andre go about trying to beat and break down Novak um, with the game that he has, with the style that he has? And if I'm if I'm honest, I I think he's got to somewhat hope for Novak pulling up after playing consecutive days, perhaps just feeling a little fatigued at the start, maybe not raring to go. I think that if I was coaching him, I would look for the opening salvos to be something that I would really try and hit him hard and fast and be super motivated to try and keep the points as short as possible. And I mean, clearly he needs to get his forehand into play um, as, as often as he can. But I almost feel like for, for Andre, there's an argument to to serve to Novak's forehand almost not exclusively. That would be wrong because Novak's forehand return is so strong if he knows it's going there. But I think there's an argument to say, go there, 75 percent of the time on the juice and the ad the ad's an easy one because the ball comes through the court a little bit more centrally that will allow Andre to get his forehand into play and I think he has to push the envelope on his first shot on the forehand side um on the on the juice side Novak has a great fade forehand down the line but there's going to be more balls that are going to come through the middle of the court that he can potentially get his forehand into play because his plus one on his backhand Gil of of, for Andre is going to go cross court into Novak's backhand and he's going to set up the point you know going cross court waiting for those opportunities Andre's going to cheat into that backhand corner which is going to leave him a little exposed for Novak's backhand down the line which is not Andre's strongest shot he can hit some beautiful ones but it's not his strongest shot so I, I, I think the focus has to be very micro ambitious for Andre in terms of trying to look after his own serve and then just try and have a nibble at any stage on, on Novak's serve when it's, when it's maybe not firing at its best. I love that point about the serve direction. And I'm, I'm especially interested in Andre's second serve because <laughs> I, think, I think that's one of the areas where I would say, oh, it, it's different now. It's better now. Maybe, I don't know, compared to Australia, but definitely compared to 2022, 2021, where you know his second serve was coming in at 80 miles per hour a lot of the time and it's like okay it's just gonna you're gonna be in huge trouble against a returner like Novak I I've been watching his second serve win percentages they've they've actually been quite good I feel like he's mid 90s I I haven't looked at the number but I feel like he's averaging mid 90s now and uh if he can get the second serve into the forehand sometimes and he can hit it big enough to do that I think that would be massive for him um what are your thoughts on Rublev's second serve yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I think he's got to take a risk there. I think that um, he's got to try and hit more slice serves. He's got to try and curl it. The kicker is going to get fed straight into that two-hander of Novak, which obviously on the ad side is going to be the diagonal da- dagger straight cross court more often than not. And then he's going to be obviously plus one with his two-hander. Similarly on the juice, you're going to throw the kicker in there. Novak's just going to just direct it straight into the two-hander. I, I agree. I mean, I think he's... 
I would like to see his uh, roll the dice a little bit on that second serve potentially and, and, and go a little bit bigger with those numbers and maybe even squeeze it up to around 100 into that forehand side. He will serve some more doubles, but I think the, the risk reward profile hopefully for him would be significant enough to kind of give himself a little bit more um, safety in terms of protection of that second serve and just accept those those double faults. Of course, the harder you hit the ball, the further it travels, hopefully the slightly deeper in the box, which will keep Novak slightly more at bay. Listen, it's a tough proposition. If it was easy, Novak wouldn't be sitting with the most grand slams of all time. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Rublev um, also trying to make his first major semifinal 0-7 in quarters. This is a tough spot for him. Uh, my, my second argument would be that with the Monte Carlo title, uh, there might be more big match confidence for Rublev. So I do hope that at least uh, we get his A-plus game. And I do think nowadays there's a little bit of a higher chance of that happening because I, I think there's a bit more belief uh, and, I guess, uh, security and comfort in, in what he's accomplished in some of these big matches. Let's talk about Djokovic coming in as the major uh, favorite in this tournament. He's had some close score lines, particularly with Hercotch and Jordan Thompson. H have you seen any cracks? Um, not really. Um, I, I, I actually sat on the court last night to watch Novak live, uh, which is always a privilege and a joy to watch somebody that can return a tennis ball that is consistently coming in the 135s plus and getting it back into play and taking away you know, somebody's best asset and at least making them work hard. I know there was, you know, no breaks in those opening couple of sets, but the, the quality of Novak's return off those serves consistently is just, it's, it's mind bending, to be honest. Um, his serve is, is just so well placed consistently, it, it, you know, for somebody like Hubie who can roll the dice on returns because his serve is so dominant that he can take some risk. Um, Novak just looks so secure under pressure that I, I don't think Hubie could serve much better than he served yesterday mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, did a great job of it again today. That's the problem. And and I actually saw Nick Kyrgios' tweet about the fact that it's, you know, Berrettini uh, potentially was going to be somebody that could trouble Novak on the grass because he has a serve like Nick's. And you know, obviously that didn't happen for Matteo today, but I'd, I'd have to concur with Nick's conclusion that it is incredibly difficult to see somebody beating Novak without a serve that is of that quality. Yeah, and I, I can be on board with that. I, I would answer the question the same as you did. I haven't seen any cracks. I would push back on if someone said the match with Thompson, the match with Hercotch, if somebody said something like, well, he almost lost, he could have lost, I would push back on that because while – you know, Thompson served and volleyed immaculately. Hercotch served incredibly. It's as well as you can serve. Novak took care of his own serve against both those opponents. I don't think Thompson had a break point. Hercotch had, had one look over four sets. There was one look, and he converted. So it's like, were they close, or were they just serving great? And I would, I would go a little bit towards the latter, not to take anything away from them. I just don't 100%. think Novak was close to losing the tennis matches. Not at all. And I think you make, you know, the most salient point is that Novak's serve is just, it's a rock under pressure. Um, he gives you very few kind of looks. And the, the nature of the surface is always going to make these matches close. And I think that's one thing that's really admirable from all the players that we've witnessed over the years, from, from, from Roger, from Novak, from Rafa to Andy, on the grass courts that they've dominated is the fact is that these matches will be closer than on clay on hard more often because there is just the element that the serve can get you out of trouble. It can get you that many more free points, regardless of, you know, the nought to four shot rally status. The serve is going to be more productive on this surface. And yet his mentality, his calmness under this onslaught, knowing that if they get into a baseline rally against her catch, Novak's probably 60-40, if not 70-30 favorite to win it. And yet mentally, he is a giant. Yeah, well said. Sinner Safiulin. Uh, they've played once before ATP Cup this year, or yeah. actually, well, it was this year, right? Uh, Yannick uh, took was that it this one. year or last? Yeah, it might have been was last year? year. I think it was ATP. It was ATP Cup last year. I think he won a okay. he won a tight first set center and then and then one and two. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thanks for that. I I knew it was ATP Cup, but got fuzzy on the year. Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah. 
Yannick Sinner. There's been a lot of changes down, uh, down under. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, Sinner with the chance to reach uh, his first major semifinal. The draw has been ideal. It's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of pressure on a guy who hasn't done it, who's now expected to do it. I feel like that's his biggest obstacle. Uh, but I think he's handled it really well so far. You can speak on that. Um, I also am curious what you think of his new serve. Yeah, he's gone through a few iterations with the serve at the moment. And I think that he's obviously trying to find the optimum stance. He's trying to find the optimum sort of feet position, whether that's platform, whether that's step in pinpoint. Um, listen, I, lo I, I love all that stuff, Gil. I mean, you've probably followed me enough to, to understand that I am a big fan of technique. I am also a very big fan, by the way, of mental strength, but I am very big fan of, um, of technique. And I, and I think that sometimes we live in a, in a society that is very big on cliches in terms of 10,000 hours, things that we can package nice and neatly. Uh, we like to lose the nuance in, in discussion. Um, and it's very easy to say that hard work, you know, outworks talent all the time and all of those things. But, but ultimately, when I watch a lot of sport, I see technique as being equally as important as, as any of those things. I, I, I meant it when I said it yesterday about Hubie's forehand. It's just not as good technically as Novak's. And, and so when it breaks down in the big moments, people will always go to the fact that he's not mentally strong. But I will go to the fact that it's just a little flawed as a, as a technique. And I think from that point of view... Um, it's it's really important for people to understand that th those kind of changes that Yannick is going through at the moment um, possibly will go back two steps to go one step forward. But I think they're ultimately so important because the security that he will ultimately have, knowing that he's found the right serve for his game and the right technique, will hold him in good stead as he picks up grand slams, which I've had no doubt he will do. Yeah. I really admire whatever I, whatever the result is now or yeah. next month or the month after, I really admire the fact that he's like, okay, my serve right now, it's not good enough. I want it to be better. And I'm willing to take risks and make changes in order to make it better. And it reminds me a lot of the big three, honestly. Yeah, and I think if you go back and look at Rafa's forehand over the years, you're going to see many iterations of that forehand. We see the follow-through a lot of the time, and everyone always, again, wants to see the finished product. But if you look at his backswing, um, you'll see a racket face that points down the court throughout the course of his career. You will see a racket face that points to the side of the court on the backswing um, before he starts coming through. He is He's changed his serve, as everyone is well aware of, in terms of what he's been trying to get out of it and, and pace through the bounce and all of these little things. Look at Andy, even at this stage of his career, still not stepping back on his back foot anymore, wanting to use a little less leg drive, but more arm speed to try and keep the pace through the bounce. Um, these are the things that are never easy um, because they are uncomfortable for, for players like that. But ultimately, um, I, I think they're a necessity because even if they don't work, they at least show you that the way that you had it was was the best way. And, and Yannick's serve has, has changed consistently in the last two years. We've had a very short swing. We've had a very long swing that's gone in behind his back leg. It's gone up from the outside of his left leg. So there's been a whole bunch of things, but he is looking for something that gives him the kind of free points that, or, or even strategic serving that he needs. Safulin uh, beat RBA in the first round, who was my pick to make yeah. a quarter out of this section. Uh, a quarter that, and by the way... Wrong. Uh, yeah, exactly. It was like, you know... It, it was easy to identify yeah. that we could get a wild card out of this part of the draw and uh, not, not a literal wild card, a figurative one. No. In, in yeah, Roman no, those British ones. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, also beat Chapo. From what I saw, you know, from RBA, I, I was expecting a, a, a yeah. better level than, and Chapo had had the knee issue. This is Safulin's second top 10 match. To be honest, I, I don't really know what to expect from him. And I guess my assessment uh, of, of him as a, as a player from what I've seen, which is admittedly not as much as I would like, is uh, he's going to go after his ground strokes. He's going to hit them big. He's going to hit hard to small targets. And uh, we'll see what happens. Do you have uh, anything, any more Roman Safulin to add? 
no, in not in that regard, because I think this is one of those those matches that I think from a top player's point of view, which Yannick is, and he's in that category, uh, is that he is better in nearly all of the categories. This is a match that Yannick should feel comfortable even on a huge occasion going out to play his type of tennis. I know that tennis matches in general, are, are, there's wafer thin margins at times. When we look back at them in terms of points one, you just need to look at Shrontek's first set against Benchit. She was ahead in every single category apart from the one that mattered, which was actually winning the set. But every other category in that opening set against Benchit, she was ahead of, just not the one that mattered, which was winning the set point. Um, and and I've always said, and whoever I've worked with, this game can be super complicated if you delve too deep into data in matches like this, you need to make sure that your game is better than 95% of the players out there, if you can, and not everybody can, but if you are lucky enough to be given certain talents to make it better than 95% of the players, because then you don't have to worry as much about strategy because you are simply better, which makes it a lot calmer for you to go out in these moments and actually know that you're going to be able to dictate and the match is going to be played on your terms. And that's kind of how I see that matchup going, that Sinner should feel comfortable enough that his his best tennis, regardless of the strategy that's brought from the other side of the court, will be good enough for him to get through. Yeah, 100%. I think it's managing the nerves. Ultimately, if those set in with the Correct. expectations on his shoulders, that's, that's the main key for him. Uh, Medvedev versus Eubanks. Really excited for this one. They've played once before. It was in Miami. Uh, I was close in the in the opening set, especially. Uh, Chris yeah. Chris feels as though uh, this rain delay allowed Daniil to actually make some adjustments that were effective adjustments, uh, such as kind of moving up on on the second serve, which is interesting because watching Medvedev throughout Wimbledon. My observation has been he hasn't adjusted all that much. He's pretty much playing his game. Uh, I haven't seen a drastic increase in aggression. I have not seen a drastic change in court positioning. Uh, do you think that could cost him, or or do you think it, it comes back to Daniil uh, in a similar vein to what you just talked about, is doing what is going to allow him to play his best tennis? I, I, w- I would expect to see Daniel... Um... You know, Daniel's that lovely new prototype of tennis player, serves huge, can reel through service games and make you play quantity of shots on the return. And that's what's made him a great player. I mean, it's quite a simple equation. He's got a mathematic brain and he's played the percentages and it's brilliant. Um, And I don't see that there'll be a huge change from Daniel. I do expect to see him probably serve a little bit more into the uh, Chris Eubanks forehand than perhaps some of the other opponents have done on some of the big moments. Chris's backhand return has been uh, pretty exceptional um, throughout his title run in Mallorca and also here so far in some of the big moments against Chris O'Connell. He just drilled a couple of beauty backhands um, in the second set breaker. And I think that Daniel will probably not give him as many opportunities or he will certainly serve a little quicker at times into that backhand side if he has to go there or into the body of Chris um, I, I actually think to be honest Gil this is this is a fun match for both I mean Chris's serve is going to keep him very competitive but if I was in Jill Savara's shoes I would want Daniel to make Chris hit as many tennis balls as he can if if you can make the first set last <laughs> over an hour if you're Daniel um, that is a great outcome even if you lose it because Chris has played so much tennis in the last few weeks that you have to figure that at some point the emotion the run the uh, everything that he's invested in this particular wonderful story is probably going to run out on him so you, you if you're Jill's you're just fight for the first set make it last even if he's playing lights out tennis just try and get yourself through an hour even if you lose it that's a great out- outcome for you make him hit as many balls I wouldn't expect to see Daniel come out early on and really take on Chris's second serve, drill the backhand cross into the one-hander. I would expect him to play from deep and just try and extend rallies against Chris as much as he can, try and pick him off if Chris is going to start making some deeper runs from from just inside the baseline to get himself into the net. So I think from from 
the way that I would look at that match. This is a match at this stage of the tournament, given that everything that Chris has been through, that Dano will feel my my normal style should be good enough. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, I think Daniil's return will give him the ability to accomplish that mission. That's the big difference between the, if, from Eubanks' perspective, playing Tsitsipas and playing Medvedev is it, you hit a good first serve in a Tsitsipas' backhand. And if you don't win the point outright, you're probably going to have an opportunity uh, to finish or attack the next ball in a big way. And uh, Daniil is going to make more. And uh, I, I love actually the term just quantity of balls. And I think that's what Eubanks is going to get on serve. That said, with the offensive repertoire that Chris has displayed, and I, I saw a great stat on Twitter from, uh, from Reem, uh, that Chris has hit 247 winners and route to the quarters, yeah. <clears throat> which is the second highest ever in the open era uh, through the first four rounds. I don't know if that's a Wimbledon statistic. I assume it is not uh, all yeah. majors. Okay. So it's a Wimbledon stat. That paints a great picture of of Chris's ability to take the racket out of your hands, and I I almost feel with when with this matchup, if if Eubanks has a plus, plays clean, he could do it. It's just he's going to have every opportunity over and over again to make mistakes and to miss balls, and I I actually think Daniil will be effective in that strategy. I think that he's just going to get enough. He's going to put enough in the court to find errors. But I think if Chris plays clean, I think, I think he can win. Yeah. I, I mean, look, I, I think, I think he can, I think there's one big difference. The likes of Cam Norrie that he played lefty big, heavy spin into the single hander of Chris that comes up at a nice height for somebody of Chris's height. Uh, Chris O'Connell, one handed backhand loads more spin, as you know, Gil, Ball comes up nice and high into the back, into the back end of Chris Eubanks. Um, obviously, we have that with Steph. We have a, a definite weakness with Steph on the on the single hander. Uh, you know, I, I saw his, uh, I have a stat with Andy when he beat him in Stuttgart against Steph, where he made seventy percent plus of his forehand returns, and he made barely thirty percent plus off the backhand side. So you have a real go-to place when you're taking on step. You don't have that against Daniel. You don't have a, a place where I could say for sure you go here, you're you're going to be in in the pound seats. He's going to make more backhand returns than he's going to make forehand returns, Daniel, in general. Um, but that backhand is one of the flattest out there. Chris is going to deal with a completely different ball coming through at a completely different height into his one-hander. He is not going to be able to flatten out as much. He's going to have to put a little bit more pace on it. He's going to have to get down to that ball. And for me, the way that Daniel hits the forehand, that's going to be, again, something that's going to be a little bit different for Chris's forehand. But for me, the biggest differential that's coming up for Chris is going to be the backhand side from Daniel um, coming into his one-hander. He's not going to be able to be as aggressive as you so beautifully pointed out in terms of the winners that he's produced. Yeah, that's great. Something I, I hadn't considered. I think Daniil's backhand cross court is as unattackable as it gets. Sure. Like you just don't get anything to look at off of it, uh, which is a great power. Yeah, and, and that's where we are as a sport. We'll, you won't see that, will you? You, you can't quantify that because mm -hmm. you'll see an unforced error from Chris and it will, it will seem as though Chris has made a bad choice or Chris isn't playing well. But it's it's a neutral backhand from Daniel that puts you under pressure to make something happen because Chris isn't going to want to play nine shot rallies consistently. It's not that he can't win them against Daniel, but he doesn't want to play those consistently. But that that neutral backhand from Daniel into a big target coming through at a low height is actually on a surface that he hasn't necessarily conquered yet. Daniel is a big advantage for him. Yeah. All right. One more and. It's, it's a matchup I've really wanted to see for a long time now. And it's, it's almost strange, in a, similar to how we didn't get Alcaraz Djokovic when we were asking for it for so long. It's almost strange how long it's taken for Alcaraz and Runa to play again uh, since, uh, since Paris Bercy. And I'm going to be a bad host here and not set you up very well because these guys are so complete that it's hard for yeah. me to pick keys to this matchup. When I think about it, it's not obvious. And I, I have an answer, but I want to see what you say. Just kind of open-ended. What, what are you zeroing in on when you watch this matchup? 
for, for me, it's all about how well they serve off their first serve in terms of maneuvering their opponent around. It's not about the free points that they make. It's about the strategic serve that, and how often they can both get their forehands into play. How often can we make that combination happen? It's just how you would move your chess pieces right at the start of any chess match. How can I do that most effectively to put myself in a position to win? I, I don't think this is in any way about pure power. Um, they both have power. They both have deluxe power, actually, um, when they need it. They both can drop the hammer on their serves. Um, they both can obviously gun their forehands. Um, I, I would say at times Holger feels as though he has easier power off the two-hander. I know how good Alcaraz it is, but I watch Holger tonight in a couple of those kind of neutral rally situations with Grigor, and he just fires it line, and it looks so balanced. Um, that he never looks as though he's in trouble. It, it, that is a marginal thing. But f for me, Gil, it's going to be very much about how both of them can can get their opponents out of position to keep control of the points. I, I think Unforced Error Counts is going to be um, very significant in terms of a player that's feeling as though they are dancing to somebody else's tune, trying to hit their way out of trouble because they're not able to dictate. We saw Holger tonight using the high rolling forehand into the single hander of Grigor, giving him no pace, uh, changing it in terms of the shortness to the depth and then seeing space into the forehand side to try and exploit that. Um, it won't be as easy to do against Carlos with the two hander, but for me, uh, the serve and where they serve um, and how they hit their plus one is going to be probably the most interesting thing for me. I definitely had the how they hit their plus one in mind. Yeah. And I think I, I think I do trust Alcaraz's forehand uh, right now more uh, than Holger's. I've seen different variations of Runa's forehand, but ultimately I like it when he's playing heavy topspin. And I think it's it's very consistent that way. He gets a lot of jump off the court. Uh, what we were seeing him do on clay with how often he was going down the line, uh, I think he's really gotten very proficient uh, using his forehand that way. I think Alcaraz is more proficient when it's when it's kill time, when it's let's finish this point off, let's do some serious damage. Uh, I've, I'm so impressed with Runa's defense, especially his slice defense, but I think... I don't think defense is good enough against Alcaraz almost ever. I think you need to be in control with the way the ground stroke power he has and the way he can come forward to finish things off. I, I think but isn't I that just... the beautiful thing about this matchup, Gil? Isn't that the beautiful thing? Like we, we can sit here and I think both of them incredibly proficient when they get up to net. I, I've seen a few comments yep. about Holger not being a great volleyer. I, 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 again, I put my hands up and say I don't. I certainly don't know everything, but I, I've watched Holger, and I'm, and and maybe I'm wrong, but I'm going to put him up there as one of the top five volleyers in the men's game right now. I think he has a great understanding of where to stick the volley. Um, he has a willingness and a love to come to the net, which counters an awful lot of the problems that other players do. Um, so therefore, his transition is a lot quicker than others because he's actually hunting to get into the to the net. And I think that is a place that he's going to have to do some good work from. He's not going to be able to beat Carlos uh, consistently from, from the back of the court. So I think, you know, from, from that point of view, I, I would say that out of the corner, uh, Alcaraz's forehand... Um, is is better at end of range than Holger's right now. That would be a play. I think I think Carlos going forehand to forehand. I quite like that play for him against Holger. I feel that gives him a few options. For Hol for Holger, I'm looking at when I'm looking for the neutral ball. I'm not looking it through totally through the middle. I'm looking at at about a meter meter half into the backhand side to try and stop Carlos from getting that forehand into play, but going big and quick through that particular segment, not straight. We love to talk middle, but it's a bit too general in a match like this. I think you've got to go middle through a meter, meter half of that middle to just try and find the two-hander of Carlos to keep him quiet. And then if you see some space, when you go wide, you're going to have to attack it and, and, and take that risk on. Yep. Uh, you and I love tactics uh, very much so, but as I, as I learned the hard way in the Roland Garros semifinal this year, uh, sometimes it's unwise to ignore the mental part. Do you have any read on? <laughs> uh, yes. Do you have any read on? Um, I guess how these these two, you know, look. They uh, Holger, I think, for a long time has had almost a chip on his shoulder about 
you know, I'm Carlitos's age and I'm yeah. pretty great too. So like, let's don't forget about me. And, uh, I, I love that about Holger. I also think that Alcaraz has been in this, in this, these kinds of matches, uh, for his age so many times, it's unbelievable. Uh, so I mean, look, I personally think they're both going to handle the moment quite well, but I do want to ask the question to you. I think this is a very different situation for for Carlitos, first of all. I think this is a very kind of, if you want to call a quarterfinal of a major, relaxed situation. There's not a lot of pressure on him to win Wimbledon this year. I don't think anyone's really kind of sitting there. That, yes, he's the top seed, but everyone that, that knows tennis it knows that Novak's the red-hot favourite to, to pick up an eighth title. So I think for Carlos's point of view, this is a very great learning curve where he's not really got the weight of expectation on him. I think he felt that at the French. I think he thought that he was the better player. There was lots of people saying that Novak was going to to win that particular match. And that was that was exhausting for him. And he admitted it afterwards, uh, the whole weight of expectation, the time building up to the match actually caught up with him in the match. He doesn't have that problem here. He's He can relax. I think Holger has that problem far more. If, if there was one person I feel that would probably struggle a little bit more physically it would be Holger because he is going to be amped up he is going to be ready to go and as you've just rightly said prove a point this is his time he said he wants to win a major here's a guy that's hit most of his goals in his life he is super ambitious um, so from that point of view this is an opportunity for him to really make his mark on one of the biggest courts, the biggest stages in the game of tennis. So therefore, he's going to have to manage that kind of fire in the belly that, that obviously he he has that's made him a great player. So I, I actually think that this is a little bit of a flip from what you talked about, the semis of the French. That's a, great, way, argu I, that's a great argument. You convinced me. By the way, I am a fully paid up, subscribed fan member of the Holger Rune Club because <clears throat> I think Holger is... I, I know he's done a few things and probably said a few things that have definitely ruffled a few feathers. And he's had to learn pretty sharply that as a teenager, as a 20 year old, that you don't say and that are inappropriate. But at the same time, uh, I'm a, I'm a diehard fan. I think I don't want to see him change too much from where he is. We, we love to live in the past. Um, and we love to kind of keep judging people on the things that we've seen from them in the past rather than where they've come to. Um, and I, and I think that he has improved for somebody that's 19 year olds that doesn't need to improve really because he's a multimillionaire and he's going to be um, hugely successful. I think where he's come in the last 12 months is just sensational. And, and, and I'm, I'm as excited as everyone about this clash. Yeah, I can agree with that. I don't think he's done anything in the last year. And I'm, I, I never say who fans should like and who they shouldn't like. Yeah. Right. But no, no, no. yeah, but at the same time, uh, he, he's been, Basically, what I'll say and what, where I'll agree with you is he has not done anything in the last year that calls his character into question. In the last 12 months, there's nothing. I mean, someone might not like what he's fist yeah. pumping or, or he takes a medical time out, but, you know, that stuff is, is on court stuff. Uh, so I agree with that. Last thing, I just think it's worth mentioning. I, Alcaraz has played two bombers in a row here. Yeah. That is the play, play style that I, coming into Wimbledon, was most worried about for Alcaraz. If you're going to tell me Nicholas Jari making 76% of his first serves and just crushing second serves off of both wings, that's the, that's the worst case scenario, and Alcaraz gets through that and finds solutions there. You see that the same way? Yeah, I, agree. I think everyone kind of feels as though that, but there's not any sort of genuine surf box out there. Um, you know, Berrettini isn't. It's funny, isn't it? Why is Berrettini not considered the surf box? Well, he's got, I, I don't know. Uh, he probably, I, I, I think on, on the scale of like how many skills, how much skill do you yeah. have outside of your serve? I, I yeah. would say Hercotch is, is a, a little bit more of one. Uh, but I mean, Berrettini, it's really the forehand after the serve. That's the amazing secondary weapon. Yeah, because I mean, Johnny Isner, amazing hands around the net. I mean, just, you know, fantastic. Riley, I wouldn't want to go in a baseline rally with Riley. He'd, he'd, mm -hmm. he'd cuff me every single time. Um, so, yeah, it's just, it's interesting. I mean, I, I thought Carlos did an amazing job on the second serve at Berrettini. And that, that clearly is where you have... Um, a game plan and you have an ability to go to work. I mean, the first serve 
he can take the racket. We've seen it so many times from the Italian that, you know, he's he's dictating completely the pace of pay. But to, to come away from a match like that on a grass score, uh, for Alcaraz to win 51% of the second serve points, that, that says a lot about the Spaniard's sort of pre-match strategy and also his ability to return a tennis ball. Yeah, and, and made m- many more returns than Zverev was able to. And, and Zverev's a good returner. So, so that was impressive Correct. to see. Uh, Petch, thanks for staying up late for us. Uh, I really appreciate it. Anytime, Bill. You, you have the, a wonderful, fresh, very original perspective on this game. <laughs> Seriously, I mean that. And that's why Thank I love you. having you on because you genuinely say things and, mm-hmm. and have points of view that, I, uh, that are only coming from you and I'm not hearing anywhere else, which I love. Uh, thank you, but anytime you, you want me to come on, I love, I love chatting to you about tennis. It's been great. Thanks. Thanks a lot. My thank you to Mark Petchy again for joining us. I know in the flow of conversation, I didn't give picks. I didn't ask Petch to give picks. Maybe I could have, but I didn't. So uh, I will throw them in here right now, rapid fire. I like Djokovic in three. I like Sinner in three. I like Medvedev in five. I think Chris pushes him. And I like Alcaraz in four. Enjoy the matches, everybody. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you next time.